Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to tour the world's ocean and look at the different ecosystems and habitats. Uh, so, most of the, the, the habitats we're going to talk about you may not be familiar with, not visited. So, we do have a fair share of images, photographs, and uh, I'll try to, to work through it with you. So the major ecosystem of the sea, uh, we have studied what we call the intertidal or littoral zone. Uh, the mangroves, mangroves we, we should be familiar with. The salt marshes and mudflats and the beaches and the barrier island you should be familiar with. The rocky intertidal zone, uh, New England on the east coast, much of the west coast, uh, characterized by a hard substrate algae, colder water. Right after subtidal, subtidal is below the tides, we're still fairly shallow, but the subtidal zone we'll take a look at, and then lastly, deep sea vents. So the intertidal zone is characterized uh, in, in the rocky or in areas where there's a, a lot of uh, wave action, you actually have a spray zone where it's constantly being moistened by, uh, by sea spray and those organisms have to deal with it. Other places like here, you don't really get much of a spray zone because we don't have that wave action. Uh, the high tide zone is the extreme back end of the marsh or the extreme back end of the uh, mangroves uh, here in Florida where you don't necessarily get inundated every day. You may get inundated only on spring tide. Uh, as you move toward the middle, you probably spend most of your time uh, isolating by inundation and exposure. And then when you get to the low tide zone, you may only be exposed on the extreme low tides uh, or be underwater most of the time. So it all depends on where you are in the zone as to how inundated or how long you're covered with water or how long you face exposure. Uh, so the mangrove communities we've gone through, uh, so we'll take a look at them now. That is uh, Tampa Bay Watch. On the way to Fort DeSoto, you passed it. And these are some of the spoil islands and the mosquito ditches in uh, the mangroves there. Uh, Mosquito ditches, as we mentioned, were dug to control mosquitoes because on these spoil islands, water would pool up, mosquitoes would breed, and they thought by digging trenches and increasing the drainage that uh, they would help uh, end the mosquito problem that, that we still face because it didn't really work. There was uh, some saltwater brine mosquitoes and also uh, didn't quite pull all the fresh water off. So we still uh, face quite a mosquito uh, challenge uh, in our uh, communities here. So the mangrove communities, uh, they're tropical trees. They're the only plants that can actively remove salt. Our three species here are totally unrelated. Uh, we just call them mangroves. Uh, because they're always uh, removing salt, but they're, they're not related. Uh, they provide food and cover for fish, animals, roots, anchor, shorelines, uh, plenty of habitat. The rocky intertidal zones. Uh, this is an image from a tide pool. You can see uh, the algae growing, growing uh, on the rocks some seagrass in the full pools, uh, also algae. These uh, algae can survive exposure for a period of time and then rehydrate. It does zone like most, you know, here we're familiar with the mangrove, the red mangrove zone, the black mangrove, the white mangrove, the buttonwood, everything zonates. Then you have the scrub and the maritime forest, you get these layers. On the rocky intertidal zone, you get the layers as well. So from the water back, you have the subtidal in the red zone. Remember, red algae do best in the, in the, in the deep water. 
Then you have a rock weed zone, which are generally uh, brown algae growing on the rocks. They do pretty well, do pretty well um, being exposed where the reds may not. In the subtitle zone, you probably have kelp. Uh, the barnacle zone, barnacles are the crustaceans that do well when they're uncovered. They close their trap door, open it. So there's a whole zone of barnacles. The fucoid periwinkle zone, as it's called, or as I listed it, the periwinkle zone. Periwinkles are type of snail, uh, and they're found in this zone. The black zone is really blue-green bacteria, cyanobacteria. Turns black when it's dried. Uh, so there's a kind of a black ring around these intertidal zones. And then the lichens flourish in the spray zone because they can handle the spray, uh, but not inundation. Uh, so there's a the black zone on the rocks. As you can see, those rocks have the blue-green bacteria growing on them. That rockweed uh, zone is characterized by what we call rack or rockweed, uh, so that's a brown algae. There's periwinkles crawling around the periwinkle zone, uh, typical barnacle zone covered with barnacles, and then the uh, red zone, Irish moss, nori, palmyra, the, the uh, red algae we use. So we have a, a zone with a lot of red algae. The tide pools then are uh, areas where the water is trapped and life crams in there at low tide and has to wait for the next tidal surge to, to escape. You can see around there all of the rockweeds waiting to be rehydrated. Uh, so they kind of turn uh, blackish or, or grayish until they're rehydrated. They're brown when they're hydrated. And then everything's jammed in those tide pools, just hoping high tide comes quickly. Our local rocky, quote unquote, community is the uh, oysters. The oysters grow uh, and form a hard surface. They create what we call reefs or bars. A reef, most people think coral, but a reef's a hard living community. And uh, oyster bars are analogous to sandbars. They're elongated, uh, breaking the waves in that uh, tidal zone. The salt marshes is another coastal habitat. There's some uh, wood storks there, and uh, I can see some spoonies in the back. You got the Spartina, and you also have uh, mangroves riven it. So this would be a tropical or subtropical salt marsh. You can tell by the mangroves. Salt marshes run all the way up the east coast. They don't all have mangroves. The mangroves stop somewhere around where we live. As you start heading north, mangroves, be, we're at the range of the zone of tolerance. Once you find places that freeze, no more mangroves. Uh, the beach and the barrier island are important coastal habitats as well. Uh, we know that beach is unconsolidated sediment, usually of the sand, but you have pebbles, cobbles, various parts of the world. Uh, Pebble Beach, famous beach in California where they have the golf tournaments. The golf, uh, the California current is fairly strong and they get a lot of wave action. So all sediments smaller than that wash away. So it's not a sandy beach, it's pebbly. So uh, places in high energy environments tend to get uh, larger sediment all the way to rocky cliffs. They would have the most energy washing away. So our burial island communities, which we should be familiar with by now, uh, they're zoned. We've walked through them. We've discussed them. Uh, hopefully you're experts. We're, you know, near shore. We have little sandbars. Uh, then you have the beach, which depending on the wave action, the different size of the sand, ours here on the Gulf Coast is that beautiful sugar sand because it's got the limestone. It's got the quartz washed down from the end of the last ice age. There's algae shells mixed in. So, so we have some of the finest beaches in America. Uh, the back dunes, wind and the plants working together to form these uh, mounds of life. The scrub behind it. Then your highland, which is maritime forest here. Some more scrubs. And then that tidal flat. That tidal flat would be 
the salt marsh mangrove mud flat combo. Then in your estuary, you have the grass flats. So the term flats is used a lot, uh, but so that's what our barrier islands are like. And beaches, of course, are a lot of fun. Uh, great places for recreation as well as uh, wildlife. Our seagrass beds, another coastal habitat. We have the three seagrass bed, uh, three major types of seagrass, but there's a lot of different types of seagrass beds. Seagrass beds, again, are found in cool water, in warm water, uh, just depends the species of grass. Fresh water, brackish water. Seagrass refers to a group of plants that have under sediment stems. The leaves are blade-like and protrude upwards, so they look like what we traditionally call grass, but they're really flowering plants, pollinate underwater. The kelp forests, this is California. They are brown algae, kelp is brown algae. Can grow up to about 100 feet. They're usually found in 80 feet or less permanently subtidal water. Uh, cold, they're cold species. So Gulf of uh, the California current keeps this water cold. Uh, very productive ecosystems. The, you can see in this illustration, kelp are found on the west coast because that's how the cool currents push cold water. They're not really found moving down the east coasts. They're found above 30 degrees, maybe even above 25 degrees uh, latitude, but they're not found uh, south of that on east coasts of countries because of warm currents. So we don't have kelp on the east coast north of, the, the farthest I've seen it north is um, the Connecticut, Long Island Sound, a little bit above Long Island. Groton, Connecticut, places like that, and then north. Notice on the west coast of California, plenty of kelp. Uh, so they do need light. 80 feet is about as deep as the water gets for them. Uh, some can grow to be 100 feet in length, but they'll tangle up at the top and form a mat. You can see there's a kelp harvester there. They, they, they're harvesting that brown algae uh, because it that's how you get the gel and a lot of the chemicals from it. So they uh, range southward to about Cape Cod, a little bit Long Island area, maybe. Uh, of course, the West Coast, lush uh, kelp forests. There's the uh, giant kelp forest. You can see just like a forest is dark at the bottom, there's a canopy up top. Uh, so it's, it's analogous to a land forest where, you know, when you're in it, it's darker because there's tangle of blades, not leaves, up top. They're called blades because they, they don't have the conductive tissue as a leaf, so they're referred to as blades. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, they're on the west coast of South America, west coast of Australia. There are kelp as well. Uh, Macrocystis is the genus of the Largest kelp, the giant kelp, Macrocystis. Uh, that's found on the west coast of North and South America. So Macrocystis is giant kelp. Uh, Laminaria is the common genus and order of much kelp. Some East Coast, East coast kelp uh, pictured there, Digitata, Larncarpa, Larncarpa, uh, Saccharia, I've, uh, fortunately, when I did graduate work, I studied at the, uh, at, in, in Maine. In Maine, I, I went up to Maine and did field work at the Isles of Shoals, did a lot of um, work with these kelp. So uh, I've seen the kelp where you could throw across an entire room 
and 20, 30 foot long kelp was pretty smelly, uh, but beautiful and cool. Uh, there is a gentleman holding up a kelp. You can see that's called the stipe, what he's holding. You see the blades above uh, that. Uh, kelp attaches, not with roots, hold fast. They attach to a hard surface. Uh, and then generally they have a flotation device somewhere up near the top, which allows them to maintain buoyancy and keep the blades near the canopy of the kelp forest. Uh, there is a lot of commercial uses, potassium, chloride, iodine, uh, food. It's believed that the first humans colonized North America following the California current down the Pacific kelp forests. So uh, it does have a rich history in human development as well. Alginate, alginate is used to thicken products, ice cream, salad dressing, uh, laminaria sticks, induced dilation of the service, cervix, sorry, during um, childbirth. Moving to the warmer water, we'll dissect coral reefs a little bit. And there's a picture of brain coral. That piece of brain coral is down in Key Largo and it's one of the largest ones in the Florida Keys. You can see by this illustration along equatorial regions and east coast of countries, notice they're mostly on the east, you have reef building coral communities. Warm water, shallow water. You see specks of coral elsewhere, they are the soft coral. Not the reef building coral, but the soft coral. So they can grow at depth in those areas. It doesn't have to be warm. Look at our gulf. You know, we know, you know, you don't, we don't get reef building coral up the gulf. We get the soft coral, the sea whips, the sea fans. So our coral communities can be really divided into two types. The hermatypic coral, reef building, the ahermatypic coral, non-reef building. So all coral are polyps, cnidaria. They have stinging cells on their tentacle. Most colonial corals, that's our hermatypic coral, have zooxanthellae, which are dinoflagellates symbiosis. The non-reef building corals or solitary corals, because they don't form huge reefs, so they're called solitary, uh, do not have the zooxanthellae and are not restricted to warm, clear water. So the colonial coral, brain coral, pillar coral, mushroom coral, There's, they're ornamental for aquaria or living on the right, Lettuce coral, star coral, staghorn, elkhorn coral, those are all common. Look at the little polyps up top. When you zoom in, you can see each one of those polyps is a genetic clone of the other. Uh, so the larval sinks, finds a suitable surface, and then grows into a polyp. That polyp asexually, asexually, asexually until you have a coral head. So all of those little polyps come from one larva. Some uh, solitary coral, sea fans and uh, gorgona coral. Soft coral and sea whips are also solitary coral. As I mentioned, asexual reproduction occurs when coral replicates itself into many polyps. Sexual reproduction only occurs when it's time to shuffle the genes. So uh, then sperm and egg is released into the water column and the larva moves on to, uh, on the tides to find a suitable area to asexually clone itself after it grows into a polyp. And there's an uh, image of broadcast spawning occurring. Uh, that occurs on the full or new moon. 
Uh, I've done some scuba diving on the full moon to watch coral reproduction. It's uh, fairly amazing. You see the fish go crazy when the eggs are released because it's just like food is, food is abundant at that time. Uh, so it's really a, a sight to behold as a uh, underwater night diver. So corals are often uh, referred to as the rainforest of the sea. Warm water generally does not contain the biodiversity and productivity that cold water does, simply because cold water holds nutrients and oxygen better. But these coral reefs are shallow. They're close to the continents. So they're very diverse, where once you move off the open ocean, once you go past 80, 90, 100 feet, the ocean turns rather lifeless in these warm water areas. So these are the rainforests of the sea and the true oases in the tropical oceans. Comparing species diversity, the Indo-Pacific has 6,000 different species of coral. The Atlantic Caribbean, only 700. The Atlantic Caribbean is geologically young, as if you study plate tectonics, which you may in geology or earth science, you'll learn that the Atlantic Ocean is the new ocean as it's opening, and it has not been around for more than 150, 200 million years, where the Indo-Pacific has, Pacific has been around far longer. So the diversity has had hundreds of millions of years more to accumulate. So Indo-Pacific reefs are far more diverse than the Atlantic reefs would be. Some of the reef dwellers, there is a black tip shark, and uh, he was uh, swimming around the Bahamas during a trip that I took. There is a octopus swimming through some coral garden. You can see some, some corals there, and then the octopus is um, cruising along. There is a trumpet fish in a garden of coral using its slender body to blend in uh, and catch a nap because that was a night dive. There is a green moray living under a ledge. Uh, please note the top where you can see all those colors. Remember, red light attenuates, so you wouldn't see that with the naked eye. You only see that when you click the shutter and the uh, strobe flashes as a color corrector. So all those algae, the pink and the purple, and you can't see them. You can't see them. The rock looks black with the naked eye. So when you take pictures and then look at them, you're shocked by all the color that you didn't notice when you were diving. Uh, and we already told the story of uh, our friend, the, the sea turtle, but they frequent the uh, coral reefs as well. Now there's a, a beautiful queen angel, uh, barrel sponge. You can see sea fans in the background. You can see a butterfly fish in the foreground. Uh, that's the diversity of coral reefs. Coral reefs are very thriving habitats. Uh, there is a enemy of the coral, the crown of thorn sea star. Like a hoover, it crawls around and eats the coral. Uh, reefs are zoned from the beach out. Your inter, um, your your uh, lagoon area, intracoastal, if you will, uh, contains seagrass beds, and then you move out and you get small corals channels. Then you hit the reef crest, which would be analogous to the barrier island, and then just on the other side, moving down, you have the massive coral reef. Uh, the dangers to coral are eutrophication, sedimentation, and disease. Let's take a quick look at this. The eutrophication, as you know, is nutrient pollution, which causes the explosive algal growth, which chokes off oxygen and destroys food chains. Sedimentation. Uh, coral needs light, clear water, a dusting of sediments landing on these fragile coral will kill them. So uh, all these processes uh, are very dangerous to the coral. 
Uh, the black band disease. Black band disease is a bacterial infection that sweeps over and kills coral. White band disease is uh, an algal overgrowth. Uh, could be um, environmentally related. And coral bleaching is caused by stress, generally speaking, hot water. Hot water causes bleaching. Global warming would be devastating for our reef building corals because of this. So in the Florida, we have basically reef communities are the hard bottom, then little patch reefs. And we talked about how in that lagoon, as it's called, uh, you have little patch reefs and then down the bank reef. Coral reef cleaning stations are unique areas of symbiosis. I watched one, it was awesome. Uh, there's Jacques the cleaning shrimp and fish line up and they come in and get cleaned. And this diver was having a bit of fun and decided that it might be interesting to catch a cleaning on her teeth. So Jacques became the dentist. Uh, there's uh, our cleaning shrimp cleaning off the gills of a uh, blue tang. Cleaning gobies are taking care of a hogfish. That's a hogfish. And the little cleaning gobies are picking uh, little parasites and dead skin off that. So it's really a fascinating thing to watch this symbiosis. Some deep water habitats, they revolve around chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis. You can see in this image the tube worms. Those are six to eight foot tube worms and the uh, red plume sticking out of them is where bacteria live and they chemosynthesize. So the, the trees in the forest are actually worm trees. It's kind of a neat thing. Most uh, organisms have small or no eyes. They lack color because you don't need it down there. Why uh, use that energy when you don't need it? Uh, we discovered them with deep sea submersibles like Alvin. And the first one was found in 1977 near the Galapagos, these deep sea communities, hydrothermal vents. Uh, they're also referred to as black smokers. They spew uh, hydrogen sulfide rich, you can't say steam because, but, but chemicals into the water and uh, bacteria use that to chemosynthesize. These bacteria can be found free on mats, they can be found in clams, and they can be found in these huge tube worms. So there's a bacterial mat right there living right on the rocks, chemosynthesizing and forming the base of the food chain. Uh, the tube worms that you saw are called Rifta, that's their genus. And then Kleptogena is the genus of the giant clam, and they live in the gills of that clam. So there is a Pacific vent community, Rifta, with its associated residents, some crabs. Uh, there is a Kleptogena community down uh, on some volcanic rocks. And then you can see the size of them when compared to a human hand. They are very big clams. Uh, amphipods, copepods di directly graze on the bacteria. Snail, shrimp, crabs, tube worms, fish, octopi form food chain links, and over 300 new species have been discovered. So there's your amphipod, and then there's the cool vampire squid hiding behind its tunic. There's anglerfish and the cute Dumbo octopus. Lantern jellyfish, some albino deep sea fish. You can see bottom dweller, benthic. It has its fins uh, extreme to the side and eyes on top of the head. Uh, there's rifta up close. You can see their featheries for increased surface area and a couple of the other residents uh, hanging out in the forest of worms. Uh, clear, clear organisms are 
quite abundant in these areas as well. No need to uh, waste energy on coloration. Cold seeps are the newest discovery. They're underground or under, under ocean springs and they spew out uh, cool water that is rich in the chemicals used for chemosynthesis. Uh, we've discovered them in the Gulf first, but then they've been discovered in other areas as well. Uh, there's a little cold seep. They don't have to be big. They can be a little. And most of these little cold seeps would have endemic species. They'd be found nowhere else in the world because they're only adapted to their little environment. So that could be the only life in an area for miles coming right from there. Or there could be little pockets up, little islands uh, all over, but they're totally unique environments that we don't know a ton about. Uh, so entire communities, entire communities develop around these and chemoautotrophic bacteria form the base of the food chain. Symbiotic clams can do that, uh, live there as well. Uh, so the cold water comes up, the clams filter the water, Bacteria living on the clams use that water because they're getting a constant supply from the clams. And then that forms the base of the food chain. Uh, tube worms, tube worms, soft corals can live there. Soft corals, remember, reef building cannot, soft corals can. Uh, so you have an entire biome of endemic species right there on the Florida escarpment, 3,000 meters below sea level. Brine pools are similar to these cold seeps, except they're extreme salty water that is um, trapped underwater like a big bubble of hypersaline water, and things live there. Uh, remember, extremophiles, these uh, cool bacteria that can uh, live in hypersaline solution only. So you have an salt inversion, and it's so salty, subs can't even penetrate it. They have to sit on top of this bubble. So there's a picture of a brine pool right there. Uh, and then the submersible sitting on top of this bubble of salt water that's trapped under the ocean. So very, very cool, the ocean floor. Uh, like we know more about the moon than we do about the ocean floor. So brine, it's called salt tectonics, salt tectonics. The Gulf was very shallow. It's been exposed, been covered, been exposed, been covered. So there's a thick layer of salt from all the exposure uncovering. So now that the Gulf is covered with salt water, underneath there, there's a huge salt layer that was covered, uncovered, 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 that's seeping out, forming these hypersaline brine pools. So the history of the Gulf and plate tectonics is what forms these unique environments that were just recently discovered. Uh, again, there's a deep sea submersible sitting on the bubble, studying it. So that's how we're studying these right now. They don't get any light. Uh, they're the only life for miles around, these salt bubbles. Uh, so they're fascinating and exciting new places that we have discovered on this planet.